Hello, my name is Jen Sunshine here with my dear friend and longtime creative partner, David Ng. And together we are the co-artistic directors of Love Intersections, a media arts collective that produces intersectional and intergenerational film and artwork from underrepresented communities. We're also founding members of the Vancouver Artists Labor Union Cooperative, also known as Value Co-op, which is an artist-run worker cooperative whose goal is to provide flexible living wage income to artists. Before we begin, we want to acknowledge that we are gathered here today from the unceded and ancestral territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh nations. Part of our work as labor activists and queer artists on unceded territories means working in solidarity with ongoing Indigenous struggles for sovereignty, decolonization, reparations, and land back. Hapa Talks emerged during the pandemic from our collaboration with the Lim Association in Chinatown, historically a neighborhood of Chinese railroad laborers who were brought to settle indigenous territories as part of the ongoing colonial project. So why Hapa Talks? As Jen mentioned, uh, Value Co-op is located in the Lim Sai Hor Kao Mok Association building. And when we moved into that building in Vancouver's Chinatown, we had long conversations about the role um, that artists have played in gentrifying the neighborhood. And we were very intentional about wanting to build reciprocal relationships um, with uh, folks in Chinatown and in the broader community as well. And so for the past two years, we've been collaborating with the Lim Association on a project to digitize their archives and to create a series of artworks that invites people to learn and engage uh, with their positionality to Chinatown and Chinatowns. Uh, with the increased conversations about anti-Asian racism, anti-Asian racism recently, the past two years have brought to surface already existing yellow peril narratives re-emerging again during the pandemic. We've seen Chinatowns and elders targeted by racial violence and vandalism. We've seen a rise of boba liberal organizing around hashtag stop Asian hate demands for hate crime legislation, which is pro-police, pro-surveillance uh, and harms black and indigenous communities. We've seen gentrific gentrification eating away at the souls of Chinatowns and other BIPOC communities seemingly with no end in sight. This season, we'll touch on themes of diaspora, xenophobia, systemic racism, intersectional solidarity, and Chinatown futurities. Uh, before I introduce our guests today, I want to thank our incredible team, Ava and Cameron, behind the scenes who help make Hapa Talks a reality. Pearl Lowe is a non-binary story artist, comics artist, author, and muralist based in Vancouver, BC. Most of their works are rooted in themes of self-love, acceptance, and Chinese Canadian and Caribbean Canadian experiences. Lowe primarily works in animation for TV and feature film and has worked on projects such as Hair Love, Canvas, and Craig of the Creek. Uh, on Cartoon Network. Currently, Lowe is storyboarding at Cartoon Network and Lowe's two graphic novel adaptations, The Adventures of the Bailey School Kids, Vampires Don't Wear Polka Dots, and The Adventures of the Bailey School Kids, Frankenstein Doesn't Plant Petunias, are now published by Scholastic and are available in stores worldwide. Welcome, Pearl. Hello. Hi, Pearl. Hi. <laughs> nice to see you both. Nice to see you. Yeah, How are you nice doing today? <laughs> I'm doing good. I I tell this to everybody that in order to get excited for the weekend, I have dubbed Thursday, Friday Eve. So happy Friday Eve. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and I'm very excited for today. <laughs> Um, Pearl, I thought, you know, um, we've, um, I've been following your work for a while and we were really excited, um, to invite you to, um, put up some of your work uh, at the value co-op, uh, windows. Um, maybe we'll start with that. Do you want to share, could you share with us, um, the, the work? Oh, thanks, Jen. Um, share with us a little bit about the, um, the, the works, um, and the inspiration behind it. Yeah. So one of my things that I like to do is <laughs> kind of fantasize about, different types of relationships um, between two different generations. And I think this piece came about 
um, when I was thinking about my relationship with my own popo, grandmother, and um, what kind of activities, I think this was during the pandemic. So I was really just like creatively thinking, I'm like, oh man, like what I would have loved to do right now with uh, with her and uh, shopping, like clothing shopping uh, <laughs> came up in my mind because I think at that time I had acquired the book Chinatown Pretty, um, the street yes. um, clothing book about seniors in, in different various Chinatowns, including our own. Um, and just seeing all the highlighted fashion that's within those communities. Mm -hmm. um, and I was thinking about, actually, even though I am not a senior, I would wear some of that clothing and I would <laughs> love to match with my grandmother. Um, and so I kind of just had this idea of like, oh, like what if my papa and I went shopping in Chinatown and we just both got matching <laughs> sets of clothing. <laughs> and so I just kind of drew ourselves um, in matching mm -hmm. outfits and kind of also having matching attitudes with like the peace sign and all yes. that kind of stuff. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's super cute. Um, <laughs> I, you, Pearl, when we talked um, before, um, you had also talked about um, like the, you know, wanting to do something in Chinatown. Um, I'm, yeah, I'm curious about that. And what's the importance of Chinatown to you or your relationship to Chinatown? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, so my great grandfather had come to um, Canada and had uh, worked at like the sawmills in, in the thirties. So my relationship um, as, you know, like as a settler, has been um, going on since the 30s and my family has been here ever since and i think now um, that i'm older i intentionally want to interact with the neighborhood and make relationships um, in the neighborhood um, especially through art i think one of the things that was a part of chinatown um, that is kind of coming back hopefully um, is Hogan's Alley. There were black people who were present in this neighborhood. And unfortunately, during my time, I didn't get to see that because I wasn't born before it was mm. torn down um, mm -hmm. because of the viaduct. But um, one of the things that's important for me about having artwork displayed in Chinatown is to kind of remind people in this neighborhood of what used to be and the diversity that is within the Strathcona community. Um, when they see a lot of art in Chinatown, maybe they assume it's, you know, by a presenting East Asian person or um, maybe a white person. But <laughs> I, I, I definitely like to, to post artwork with, you know, a black face in it, like, you know, myself yeah. in that an example in the window um, to kind of just start conversations and mm -hmm. kind of show that there are different types of people that navigate these neighborhoods and have been for a very long time historically yeah. um, and right now. So I think that's something that's really important to me um, and how I'd like to continue that conversation is through art. Yeah, mm -hmm. you know, the, Pearl, what you're describing, I mean, this is, Jen and I have had lo a long conversations about this too, around sort of like, when we sort of, when we evoke, you know, and I mentioned the collaboration with the Limb Association, like when we evoke the history of Chinatown and thinking about the history of Chinese laborers, but like thinking about the, the you know, it wasn't just a space of, for Chinese people as well. Mm -hmm. and And I'm thinking more specifically like, when we evoke that this converse like this type of conversation in the past, there's also kind of a pressure right now, even from Chinese people in Chinatown, mm -hmm. to also push out or erase the 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 intersecting or encounters of people on the downtown east side of an, yeah. of, an, of indigenous folks. I'm thinking like specifically, there's been calls for like policing, you know, around the graffiti and stuff like that, and mm -hmm. so that those types of like. Um, I guess, tensions and stories that we want to, I, I think about anyways, in, in our arts practice about thinking about those, um, the other, all the other stories um, that were in this neighborhood as well. So yeah, thanks for- uh, Pearl, thanks. your your work is a hit, by the way, um, because we have people mm -hmm. um, working production um, inside the Value Co-op studio. Mm -hmm. um, one of the comments we heard from them is they heard people who like walk by and will stop in front of the window and we'll just kind of talk about your work. And um, apparently it's a, it's a huge hit. Yay, that makes me so happy to hear. I feel like that's something that I always try to like strive for in my artwork is like to start conversations. Like mm -hmm. I think that's the purpose of art in, in my art practice anyway, is to have conversations and to like, bring random strangers together. Like if two random people who don't know each other are like looking at a piece of artwork and they can have a conversation. I think that's a great thing, especially in Vancouver when talking to strangers is really like 
oh my gosh, we don't do that. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. 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 Well, that's, um, a- you know, I'm go sorry, David. I that's just, okay. go was, ahead, go I ahead. wanted to kind of nerd out a little bit because when David and I were re- preparing for this and reading your bio, we, I lost my mind when I saw <laughs> that your, um, that you um, adapted these two um, graphic novels um, and they're published by Scholastic because, um, you know, I think both David and I uh, were huge fans of the Scholastic book fairs, and it was just my yes. favorite, favorite event in elementary <laughs> school. Um, yeah, so I'm just curious, you know, um, maybe you tell us how and where you grew up and what your childhood was like, and um, did you always want to be an artist, and kind of was there like a definitive moment when you were like, I'm, this is what I want to do when I grow up? Mm, yeah. So I grew up in the East Side, um, specifically on Kingsway in Victoria. So oh, at wow. that time, yeah, I was in the heart of the East Side. And at that time, um, there were a lot of immigrant families from Italian backgrounds, from Chinese backgrounds, and mm. from Vietnamese and Filipino backgrounds, yeah. if I'm remembering correctly. So I grew up a lot, a lot around Asian kids. Um, and I think as a kid, I definitely felt like I belonged. Um, I was raised by my single mother, my single Chinese mother, and I felt very much like a part of the culture. Um, And that was really nice. You know, when you're a kid, you're friends with everybody and race Mm -hmm. doesn't really come into play. You're just friends with people. So that was really nice (laughs) um, for a long time. And um, yeah, for like, in terms of artwork, I think there, so I think now it's a Dollarama. I think it's on Kingsway and <laughs> something. I can't remember. Um, but it's a Dollarama now, but it used to be a blockbuster. And I used to live like within walking distance. And yeah. I would be able to get like really cheap rentals. And I would always gravitate towards the cartoons. And mm. um, I think at that moment when I was like five, six, although I couldn't articulate it in the way <laughs> that I can now, um, watching cartoons was really something that inspired me in a way to kind of give this feeling that I was receiving from watching this kind of, you know, content to someone else. I yeah. really wanted to give that to someone else. Wow. Mm. And so I think I started drawing from that point on. I think a lot of kids start drawing um, just generally. Totally. Um, I, I can't doodling. remember. Yeah, yeah. And just doodling for fun because they like it. Um, I think I started out as, um, there's this tweet I read, sorry, my thoughts are everywhere, but there's a tweet that I read about this professor who teaches art and he was telling his kid, I teach, you know, adults how to do art. And the kid was like, or they forget, you know, like (laughs) they were saying like, they forget how to draw. Um, And so I feel like that was me kind of as a kid, like I was just drawing because I wanted to. And I was like, okay, this is great. But it wasn't until high school when you start thinking about careers and college and stuff like that, Mm -hmm. um, that I started to think about, okay, like, what am I good at? What can I stand to do for many hours? Um, and it was doing art. So, um, yeah, so I decided to go into animation because it was the only thing I could see myself going into. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I'm curious what your favorite cartoon, like what cartoons did you rent out? Because I feel like um, for like Gen X and kind of millennial kids growing up, there was a brief, beautiful period where we all had access to, you know, Saturday morning cartoons. Mm -hmm. And it was just this like marathon of, you know, incredible cartoons. I remember Mm -hmm. um, loving Recess as a kid um, and Miss Gretchen. Cracky, the the, mm-hmm. the teacher who's like sort of hippie, but like really social justice oriented. Mm-hmm. Um, she was always, she, I, I was was really compelled by her, but I never knew why. And then as an adult, you're like, oh my gosh, she's the most radical teacher, mm-hmm. um, you know, on TV. <laughs> anyway, mm-hmm. yeah, was there a favorite cartoon? Yeah, oh man, yes, I would totally agree about like the golden era of Saturday morning cartoons. Was <laughs> definitely in the nineties and early two thousands. Yeah, I so. I did have cable at the time, so I did actually end up getting exposed to a lot of anime because they would be yeah. reruns and stuff like that oh, that would happen. Um, but I think my favorite as a kid were either um, reruns of the Looney Tunes cartoons. I would yes. laugh so hard. They're so inappropriate and violent, but <laughs> I, lo- I thought they were so funny. Um, and also um, from the anime side, because it aired on TV, I really liked watching Pokemon and Carcaptor mm-hmm. Sakura. That was something that was really important to me. Um, but I definitely also watched like cartoons, like you mentioned, like Recess, The Weekenders, Kim Possible, like all those kinds of things. So yeah, those are definitely staples in, <laughs> in my childhood experience. 
moment. Yeah, I'm trying to think what was mine. See, I didn't do the Saturday morning cartoons because that was when Chinese school was was in Saturday mornings. Oh, man. <laughs> but, yeah. but I think like it for me, it has to be like Batman. Like the oh, moody, yeah. like remember, like the those, yeah, like, the the nineties Batman, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah, very moody, yeah, you know? very moody. yeah, <laughs> yeah. 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 It's dark, yeah. Gotham. yeah, 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 exactly. Um, um, per, go yeah, ahead. Pearl, I'm curious. Just going, I want to kind of want to ask you a little bit more about your practice. Um, mm-hmm. so we kind of talked about how you got into animation, and um, some we've talked about some of your projects. What does um, yeah, what does your uh, like practice look like in terms of like? How do you how do you develop new projects? Um, I'm just I'm asking this purely out of ignorance because this is very outside of my world. <laughs> mm-hmm. but, yeah. I, I, but but I'm curious. I know you did, recently did a mural as well for the Vancouver Mural Festival as well. Yeah, so mm-hmm. I'm just curious what's what's your what does what does your practice look like in terms of yeah that? Yeah. So I think for, for first and foremost, I describe myself as a storyteller, and I kind of weave in between mediums um, as I see fit. I think the expansion into the mural space was kind of my way of testing like, oh, like I want to try to storytell in this type of way with physical paint and a physical paintbrush and my muscles doing the thing and try to create (laughs) art versus what I usually do at home is I have a computer and I have a Cintiq, which is a big Mm -hmm. monitor that I can draw directly on. I use Photoshop or I use Storyboard Pro to make my storyboards um, for the Mm -hmm. shows that I work on or films that I work on. So um, it depends on what I'm doing, um, but I always try to center um, themes of like self-love or magic. I really like magical stuff, like magical mm-hmm. girl content, magic, mm-hmm. magic, anything I love. <laughs> so I try to put that in my stuff as well. Um, and also try to, even though it's kind of like, oh, you don't have to make it palatable, but because I navigate the kid's fear, I think I try to make harder topics um, how can I say palatable for mm-hmm. for children or in a way where they can kind of receive those kinds of messages about cultural diversity, about personal identity and race and all that kind of stuff. So right. um, I try to do that as much as I can in my professional work and in my personal work. I think um, when I develop stuff on the side, I do a lot of like random doodles on like paper or in like Photoshop or whatever, just to like or in my phone, like if I have an idea, I like jot down things in my phone and and then I flesh it out later with pictures, like with drawings. Yeah. So I kind of just use whatever tool I need to use in order to to come to a kind of like complete circle with my story that I that I need. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I think that's really the power of animation, anime cartoons. Um, yeah, because you know, if we're addressing kind of more sensitive topics and subject matters, um, as an example, I uh, I used to run a queer um, education film program where we would bring, you know, queer films into schools across the province and do presentations. Um, You know, animation or animated films that we would show just would garner such like a different response and it would hit the students, it would impact the students in like a different way. Um, And you can get more kind of creative ideas out without it being super on the nose, like a documentary or like a fiction film work would be. It just, I think it it just, students, I think young people respond to it so much more different than they would with other kind of mediums. Um, But I just on that kind of, on that topic, uh, you know, there's a, when when we Google you, there is a Georgia Strait article profiling your animation. (laughs) And I think one of the first sentences starts with, um, it wasn't easy for you to figure out how to do your hair as Mm -hmm. a child. So um, obviously you worked on this incredible animated um, short called Hair Love as a story artist. Um, And of course it would later win uh, an Oscar for best animated short film in uh, 2020. Um, And and I guess my question for you is um, obviously hair, you know, you obviously you worked on this in such a collaborative and with a big team, but hair obviously is such an intimate subject, um, especially for black and and multiracial communities and particularly for, you know, families and like parents, because that is like the, the intimate domestic space where we first learn how to get ready and get dressed, right? Um, So I'm curious if you can tell us a little bit about your experience growing up in your family and how your experience helped make that film. I'm just... Mm -hmm. Yeah, Yeah. so so my experience growing up in my family was a very interesting one. Um, I think on the topic of what David was saying about the, the 
let's put like the Chinese community specifically and every other community, but especially black community, the intermingling of those two cultures is very difficult. And in the nineties, when I grew up, it was very much not okay. Um, My mom was actually disowned for marrying my dad at the time. Mm -hmm. Um, And it wasn't until I was born that um, they were like, okay, we should see our grandchild. Like, we'll talk to you again kind of thing. So Mm -hmm. that was the thing. Um, And I think still to this day, there are certain, you know, kind of, ways I experience gatekeeping in my own family because I'm not seen as fully Chinese, um, which Mm. is unfortunate, but it is what it is. (laughs) Mm -hmm. And I think being raised as a single mom too, um, was an interesting experience, especially being raised by a non-Black parent. Mm. Um, It's just their points of reference is completely different from who I am as a person and what my body does. And she did her best (laughs) with the tools that she had, but it was often like, here, let me give you a bowl cut. And it turns out to not dry well because oh, no. my hair would just be like this um, in a weird shape <laughs> all the oh, time. Goodness. So I, you know, it was a lot of trial and error <laughs> with um, with that um, whole experience growing up, um, mm-hmm. just seeing how we can kind of be on the same page um, as much as possible, even though we're, you know, kind of on different, we're, we're operating from different uh, places, but, um, yeah, I think having that experience helped me with hair love because um, the father is, you know, trying to do something yeah. for his daughter that's outside of his lived experience. He's like, oh, my God, I don't do my daughter's hair. Like, I've never done yeah. this before. My wife usually does it. So I feel like that was definitely something that I could pull from my lived experience with my mom being like, oh, my God, I don't have this hair. I don't have this lived experience. What am I going to do? <laughs> So in that way, I felt like it was a very relatable experience um, and it was something that applied to hair love. Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. so I tried to bring myself as much as possible um, in that way to the film. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah. And yeah. And I, and I try to do that with everything that I do, but I think with hair love specifically, I was like, yes, I know. (laughs) (laughs) I already have lived it. (laughs) Yes. It's just, it's such an imaginative uh, film. And I, I particularly love the, there's like, I think like an, uh, like a battle scene. It was in like a boxing ring mm-hmm. or something. And it really just very um, imaginatively kind of depicted the battle that we have mm-hmm. every single day with like your hair. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, it was, it was pretty. And then of course, then the ending with the big reveal, but I, I won't spoil mm-hmm. that for anyone who hasn't watched Hair Love. You should all watch it. It's on mm-hmm. YouTube. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, no, I, sorry, just to chime in with one last thing that you were saying about how people connect with animation in a different way than they do with live action stuff. I think it's because animation from the jump is something that's not real. So people lend themselves to more imagination and kind of give themselves up to that process and an experience. And so when you do watch like that boxing ring scene, you're like, it's yeah. not real, but you're like, yeah. those are my feelings. And that's how it feels right. fighting my hair every day or fighting this obstacle in my life every day. So yeah. I just want to say that I, I think that's something that's really special about animation. Yeah, yeah. It really enables you to, I guess, suspend belief um, mm-hmm. of, of reality. And so there's a, there, and I think animation is just, it's pretty magical if we're going to mm. use magic again. <laughs> <laughs> Pearl, I'm curious. We, we, the, we this question has come up a couple of times um, from our other guests. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm curious, like as an artist, how has the pandemic um, yeah. been for you? Um, I know that you had, you know, you had you had shared with us, you know, the working from home. But I'm I'm even thinking just like creatively, what has that? How has what has that been like for you? Mm, yeah, I think you know, in 2020, I think. 2020 was a really hard year for me. So it was 2021, but 2020 was interesting because this was a new experience for everybody. Pandemic hit, we were all trying to transfer online. Um, But creatively, I think it was a very draining year for me. I personally had four jobs and they were all creative jobs. So I felt very squeezed in that way for work um, in a a creative way that I just felt so burnt out. Um, I did a mural, I was doing my daytime job. I freelanced a couple other gigs with like Netflix and Crunchy Network. And it was just kind of like all these creative things happening because after the George Floyd thing happened, everybody who was working at a studio was knocking on every black person's door Mm -hmm. and asking their mom, are you available? Oh, suddenly we need more people to work on our team because we want to diversify, blah, blah, blah. And so 
not only creatively was it kind of exhausting, but it was exhausting kind of operating from a place where you wanted to take advantage of this wave of incoming interest, not knowing when it would settle, when that window would close. So you just kind of said, for me, I just kind of said yes to everything. Cause I was like, I'm an artist. I work on contract. I have no idea when I'm going to get my next check. Everyone's asking me to participate in these things. I have to jump on this opportunity when I have the chance. Yeah. Um, because, you know, historically when you, see black voices being valued it's only for a certain amount of time for a certain purpose until that season ends aka black history month or you know what i mean like it's just for a certain amount of time so um that was it was a really hard year for me um in 2020 because of all of that going on and 2021 kind of was the same thing um but towards the end i was like okay i need to finish off these projects and only reduce it to you know one maybe two jobs instead of four rotating jobs Mm -hmm. um so yeah, I, I think I'm still recovering from some creative burnout. I think it's extra hard and I didn't know how hard it would be to do multiple things in the creative space. Cause if I were doing other jobs like that weren't, that wasn't creative, you know what I mean? Like working other parts of my brain, it wouldn't have, maybe it would have been different, maybe not, mm-hmm. but just doing all jobs that were creative was really difficult for me. And I think a lot of other black artists felt the same way about trying to like seize this window of opportunity and just yeah. say yes yeah. all the time. And then being so burnt out because, you know, of all this extra work um, that we have no idea if we'll stay or not. Yeah. Yeah. I think people don't realize that artists, we need boredom. We need time off. We need time to ourselves. We need time to just like be and be mm-hmm. present and, and like experience and downtime. And oftentimes we need like a lot in order to create and produce. Mm-hmm. Um, so the kind of the very kind of capitalist um, demands for this like h- high production or high productivity and being able to pound out work after work after work is actually so exhausting. And that impedes on, um, for me anyways, it impedes on my ability to be creative. Um, but yeah, yeah, we Dave and I had a similar experience as you in the sense that we mm-hmm. were also trying to like a navigate the scarcity mentality that is yeah. just so entrenched in like BIPOCs, yeah. um, um, not to you know mention like childhoods and all of that scarcity comes mm-hmm. up, comes back up and the insecurities, um, and then that was exacerbated by the pandemic. And then when the pandemic uh, related, well, the onslaught of you know anti Asian racism mm-hmm. and violence, and and that when that happened, we too were. Um, reached out to, um, you know, uh, to facilitate workshops or present or participate um, or consult with, you know, anything and anything to do with yeah. like anti-Asian racism, um, just by virtue of the fact that we're Asian. And it was just like, on one hand, there's the token, it's a tokenistic gesture, but on the other, well, we have to kind of ride this wave because, we just never know when that opportunity yeah, we, is going to end. Uh, David's going to no, make a joke right now. No, but, <laughs> <laughs> no. Jen and I always joke. We're like, we, will, we're, we are going to parade, like parade that white guilt money. You know? <laughs> yeah, man. We're going to go on a tour because you know, in a year it's going to be gone. <laughs> but no, I totally feel that too because, like, yeah, like I, it's in the same way, like. Um, um, and we're continuing to do it because I'm I'm actually quite serious about you know uh, to you know that's this funding and this focus might evaporate next yes. year. Yes, but you know now we're we're juggling like you know seven eight different projects just to mm. keep this keep this going and and just you know Jen going back to your um, comment about like um, you know need the artists needing the time to develop our and the space and the mind space to develop our practice like Jen and I have had a um, uh, uh, we went on a retreat last year because we were finding that chasing all of these deliverables so using up all of our creative energy for these projects that we were really enjoying but it wasn't really giving us time to like develop like our own practice like what do we yes. want to make and what's the what's the story that we want to put out mm-hmm. there from Mm -hmm. us you know um yeah yeah that's so relatable i think a lot of artists um find themselves in this kind of cycle of just being deadline driven and just kind of just trying to do work and crank it out i think i i 
reached a point um, maybe two years ago, maybe the pandemic happened, <laughs> um, two, maybe two, three years ago, that I was like, I cannot make art without living life. Like, I just can't. Mm. I'll just be BSing my way through story. You know, because when you create something, you have to pull from somewhere. And if you're not living and pulling yeah. from your lived experience, which is, you know, what makes your stories unique because you're putting yourself into your work. If you're not living, then you're just making stuff up <laughs> and yeah. it's not authentic and it doesn't feel purposeful for me anyway. It doesn't feel purposeful um, and intentional. Um, so I totally get when you're saying like going on a retreat and just kind of reconnecting with your own purpose and like refocusing, like what kind of things you want to put out into the world. Like that's so important, but like what Jen was saying, like you need space for that. Like you need times of maybe doing nothing or maybe not talking to people or not doing art at all. Like sometimes like during my breaks, I don't even draw because I, I don't yeah. want to. And yeah. when I go back, I'll be happier too, because <laughs> I haven't been in that period of rest. Yeah. 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 I, I'm curious, I mean, maybe this is a question for both of all of us, but I'm curious, like, if you have any, like, tools that you draw on to, mm. to, to set those sort of space spaces for yourself. Um, Cause I'm, I'm terrible at that. <laughs> you are, David, you are terrible at <laughs> terrible. that. Terrible. <laughs> no, I was joking on another Hotbot Talks, like, I have just terrible work-life boundaries. I literally was checking my email at the gates of the Serengeti because I knew I knew that I wasn't going to have like proper internet for three days. Right? And as a freelancer, because I don't have, I, I, I for some jobs, I can't put on an autoresponder. There's just no one else. There's literally no one okay. else. But I don't, but it is, and you know, but, but this, this, I'm doing it again, right? I'm saying, I'm saying that there's no one else, but there's also things that I can put in place so that I'm not responding to emails at the gates of the Serengeti. <laughs> but anyways, I'm, so I'm curious, I'm curious what sort of, you know, going back to this conversation of, you know, creating space so that we have can be creative. Um, yeah. Are there any like tools or um, yeah, methods that you draw on? Yeah. Ooh, that's hard. I feel like, uh, <laughs> I feel like I'm going to sound really cynical about <laughs> the tools <laughs> that I'm going to bring up, but I, I just feel like I kind of reached a point where um, I was working a lot of like doing a lot of overtime, unpaid overtime. Yeah. And yeah. Um, I just reached a point. I was like, for what? For making cartoons? No, F this. I'm not going to be doing that anymore. And I think as a creative, it's so easy to continue thinking about your work after hours because it's a part of you and you're always thinking about tweaking it or like how it could go a certain way. Um, whereas people who maybe have non-creative jobs, um, they could just leave it at the door. They're like, okay, I clock in, I clock out and I'll worry about it tomorrow. Not everyone, yeah. but um, I think for creatives, it's, it's especially hard because it involves our personhood. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so for me, I think, I think I was just fed up. I think I just got fed up with like studios treating artists as just replaceable, you know, even mm -hmm. though we make the studio, the studio needs us, yes. we don't need them. Yes. <laughs> but I was just kind of, I kind of kicked into that mentality where I was like, okay, well, I'm not killing myself for you anymore. That's yeah. not something yeah. that I want for myself. I think, I, I think also experiencing burnout year yeah. after year after year and realizing that dealing with burnout when you're in it is not enough you got to prevent it um kind of yeah. led me to make certain boundaries for myself so i didn't enter that space of burnout and that looks different for everybody but yeah. for myself um i was like when i had multiple projects on i was like i'm not working past 10 p.m that's whatever is going to happen is going to happen um it will not work weekends whatever if I don't make a deadline, they're gonna have to figure it out. Like, <laughs> yeah, exactly, thing. exactly. Um, because I, I really need. I think it benefits them too because then I'm putting out work that's good quality versus mm -hmm. killing yeah. myself and not putting out work that's you know some a good reflection of like what I can actually do. Mm -hmm. um, just mm -hmm. because I'm stretched stretched so thinly. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I think it really is just about like seeing like looking at your your circumstances and being like, did that situation feel good to me? No, yeah. what can I put, what boundary can I put in place in order for me not to cross into that zone? Okay, boom, mm -hmm. I've identified it. That's what I won't do anymore. Mm -hmm. And if something feels good and then it's like, oh, what can I continue to do to continue yeah. to feel good? Yeah. Boom, yeah. I'll keep doing that. So I think it's about identifying and I think right. I think that's the tool that totally, I, I totally. use. Totally. You know, the biggest irony too I'm noticing is like in this in this height of, you know, demands for, you know, e equity and inclusion and diversity in the very kind of corporate 
corporatized way of like EDI, um, which is super corporate now. Um, we're, yeah. we're, we're seeing companies, you know, really, you know, um, yeah, uh, uh, doing that, though, those, those kind of tokenistic gestures of forming EDI groups and making yeah. sure their companies are diverse and, 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 and hiring facilitators to come in to do an assessment and all of that. Mm -hmm. But what they're actually not addressing and the biggest irony of all is that why workers are unhappy is is absolutely the, the there are rampant issues of you know discrimination and racism but also there's you know what about like fair wages and like less hours and the demands of yeah. like workaholicism it's like mm -hmm. and i'm seeing a, a real shift um in how media likes to portrays the blame on the you know on gen z or millennials and mostly gen z who are just mm -hmm. Un, <laughs> yeah. um, who are who are not going to take it? No. You know, millennials will yeah. will we'll, we'll do the hustle culture, which is super toxic, yeah. super terrible. Um, yeah. The grind, whatever. Mm -hmm. But Gen Z won't take that anymore. And there's a real shift, I think, socially to a kind of like anti-work um, mentality, where there's like an encouragement of four-day work weeks and so on, which we're seeing in Europe, um, not necessarily in the U.S. and Canada. But yeah, I'm curious yeah. how that's you know, where you see the, that projection going mm -hmm. um, for the creative industry, because there's just bottom lines that you have to meet, deadlines you have to meet. So how do you do that? Yeah, that's a hard one. And shout out to Europe for putting that in place. <laughs> I mean, not all of Europe, Europe obviously. Not all of Europe, <laughs> more of Europe. Yeah, more of Europe. Uh, yeah. But yeah, I think that is really hard, especially in animation when everything is deadline driven, mm. like everything. And it's always about doing things faster for cheaper. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. it's, yeah, it's really hard to like see creatives put a boundary in place being like, no, I'm, I'm not going to do this. And then the studio will be like, well, we'll find someone, we'll find who, someone can. who will. Yeah. yeah. And it's yeah. so discouraging. And I don't know if I have the answer for like how to combat that. But I think a lot of things that artists are doing are, um, is our English <laughs> um, <laughs> is um, creating their own content with mm -hmm. crowdfunding and doing their mm -hmm. own stuff um, outside of the system of studios, yeah. um, studio support. Um, I think it's still very new in, in a lot of ways for a lot of creatives doing their own thing. But I think the folks who are kind of embracing entrepreneurship <laughs> is, um, is where we're seeing more freedom and um, mm -hmm. flexibility and schedule and better work-life balance. I think at every studio, um, from an animation perspective, every studio um, has various projects and pr project to project, like you could be on, I'm on Craig of the Creek, I love my crew. And if I need help, I have that support versus someone else on another show. You look over, I remember being on the same floor and like you look over and these artists are drawing in the dark. They look sad. And I'm like, oh my God, they're probably like trying to meet deadlines because the schedule is so tight. And so yeah. it's so hard to try to instill a certain type of culture when money comes first. Yeah. And I think the answer that a lot of artists are finding themselves looking towards is just doing their own stuff. Mm -hmm. And that's not always a, a way to, um, how can I say, sustain um, a, uh, sustain a, um, an income, a stable income. Yeah. Um, so yeah. not everyone can do that. But I think people are kind of venturing into that area to see how they can make it work for them to yeah. eventually transition into a space where they're just like an independent um, artist or they start up their own studio or whatever. But I think it's yeah. sad that that it's, it's kind of like that answer that I'm like, oh, that's not an answer when you're like, oh, just be your own boss. You know what I mean? Like, I don't have to want to be my own boss to be able to have. Yeah, because it's so easy. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Like, what? And not everyone wants that either, yeah. right? Like, yeah. some people yeah. just want to go to a place, have a job, and then be treated fairly, and then go home and be cool. <laughs> like, yeah. yeah. Well, I, I mean, that we were sold this lie, too. It's like, you have to find your passion. And then if you can, if this can be your, if your passion can be your job and make you money, that is like the pipe dream, right? Yeah. There are yeah. actually just people that want to just go to work, get that paycheck, come home, and then they can do everything. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so we, we I, I, I felt, I feel like I really fell for that lie of wanting to yeah. be passionate about my job. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but you know, I think one thing to add to is there's also like a like what we're also talking about is things that are deter are determined 
to be paid, right? Oh, sorry, let me cl clarify that. Like th there's there's a certain type of work that is paid, right? Mm -hmm. And so I'm, 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 I'm just thinking about our conversation about the artist again and the artistic outputs that are like, oh yeah, mm -hmm. That that gets paid, and like I'm, I'm thinking about like there's a bit, there's a movement right now, and the city of Vancouver is starting to um, has has uh, started to recognize what they're calling quote unquote intangible arts practices. So mm -hmm. like cult cultural cultural workers who are doing work in like vital cultural you know mm -hmm. vital work that sustains communities, and now you can apply for grants to do that type of work. I, you know, for example, you know, I, I share this, this example a million times, but like my, my aunties who made soups for me every week, that type of cultural work, you know, that is often um, women's, you know, work that women do, um, emotional labor, that all that stuff doesn't get to be considered, you know, high art in the same ways yeah. that other types of mm -hmm. art. And yeah. I also think about like, just, I'm just thinking about our, our earlier conversation about like the, the work the what the space that artists need like mm -hmm. I, um we're there's a couple projects one of them that i'm a part of that is really trying to think about um how arts funding should be actually funding the work that artists do and not just like literally the drawing and the, the whatnot but like the, the time mm -hmm. yes. yeah the t the time that it the rest time <laughs> that is vital mm -hmm. for the production the the you know not having, I'm just thinking about the sort of um, neoliberal pressures that we're talking about in terms of being able to pay rent, right? If you're if a lot, most, um, you know, value co-op was started um, to to um, uh, try to alleviate employment precarity for artists, right? Artists can't make work when they're working, you know, four or five jobs. <laughs> trying I'm to telling you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So anyway, sorry, I'm going on a bit of a rant, rant no, now, but I'm just great. trying to think of like the artist, um, like our whole selves and yeah. what what is what we put into our practice that should be funded, you know, not just mm -hmm. the thing that you can sell in a gallery or you know can meet a deadline in a studio. So, oh, I just oh, that just makes me think of. Thank you for sharing that, uh, both of you, for your for your thoughts. Because I think the reason why um, art is so <laughs> I gotta say is one of the least things to be supported if supported in mm -hmm. society is because it I, I personally feel it's such a process that is anti-capitalist by nature because mm -hmm. a lot of what capitalism tells us to do is that we make a product for consumption and once that is created that that's what is deemed worthy of a price some, exactly. something right but the whole process of inhaling exhaling taking space and thinking about things and mastering a craft and then creating something and putting out into the world and, and seeing how that's received that whole connective process is not the capitalism's like, but what's the thing? Like, yeah. <laughs> what thing are you creating? Like, what is that? You know, yeah. that's something that that's, that's prized. Um, and I think that so many artists who want to kind of, move at that pace of like inhaling exhaling kind of like in and out and flowing with their creative practice it like face challenges in in spaces that commercialize their art because it's kind of like so against like their flow um and animation i think animation because it's such a commercialized thing it's it's really hard to get into that flow and advocate for more space and better deadlines and everything because they see it as a product of like, okay, we've got to release this movie. We've got to release this TV show. Like you look at Netflix right now and like they just literally like canceled a bunch of development projects right now because oh, based on- because they, they lost subscribers or- I don't know what they're doing. They're kind of going through this whole oh. company reform right now. But I think yeah. one of the things that they're prioritizing is data and data that tells them viewership is higher in these certain areas. Therefore they want to make shows in these certain areas versus- wanting to storytell and connect with audiences and go through that kind of process of of connecting with community you know what i mean because they're thinking mm -hmm. of yeah the product yeah yeah so, the bottom line yeah 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 yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. um pearl i'm I, we, we we skipped over a question that i kind of want to bring us back to um if mm -hmm. um i want to go back to the title of the um the the um the windows uh, mm -hmm. at value. Um, you you were uh, very deliberate in writing um, the pawpaw in in the I forget the name of the 
the phonetic. Yuping. Mm-hmm. Yuping. Can you tell mm-hmm. us a little bit about that and, and why? Yeah, so uh, a few years now, I've been trying to reconnect with my heritage language, Cantonese. And one of the things that um, I'm really sad to see, but happy to see more advocacy for um, these days, um, is that Cantonese is a really hard language to learn because it's very much orally passed on. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the classes that we see in Vancouver to learn Chinese, which is already an umbrella term that is erasing so many different dialects and languages within the Chinese umbrella, that they're they're Mandarin, you know, and they're not Cantonese, which is really interesting too, because there's such a huge Cantonese population here that helped build up the community, um, Mm -hmm. the communities that we now get to enjoy and explore. Anyway, so um, for the language, I I really wanted to try to make it accessible for people to gain vocabulary, um, Cantonese vocabulary, because Chinese characters, for me, in my opinion, they're not accessible. I look at a thing and I'm like, I, there's so many characters are memorized and so being placed between, you know, depending on where they're placed side by side, like it changes the meaning and all that kind of stuff. And I think being able to have a Romanized version, because, you know, we're an English speaking country, mm-hmm. um, having a Romanized way of looking at Cantonese with uh, numbers that indicate the, the tone that you're supposed to say that word in. Um, it has been really helpful for me and has been helpful connecting with other heritage speakers um, mm-hmm. that have kind of also maybe lost a little bit of their language skill or have wanted to pick it up because they never had the opportunity to learn it in the first place. Um, and it's been a cool thing to see, um, like on Twitter, even I make tweets and I do it all in new ping sometimes. And people who nice. are fluent are like, oh, I've never seen this before, but I understood what you said because yes. I speak English, I read yes. these characters properly. Yes. But if you have no, like, if you just write any Chinese characters, it's like, you know, it's just kind of like, it's harder. Um, yeah. It's harder for people who are residing, who are, like are settled here. So yeah, um, yeah so I, I intentionally um, write Cantonese um, in Yuping just to kind of loop in more cultural nuance and specificity yeah. in my work and to mm-hmm. to also show people how they could connect to different communities um, that they belong to and that they may not belong to. Because um, I yeah. know some people, we nav- people out here navigate Cantonese communities and they're like, oh, what are they saying? But if you see it written, <laughs> you're like, oh my God, okay, I've heard that word and like when I went for dim sum or what, you know what I mean? Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. And then yeah, yeah. remember. So. Yeah. It's funny. So my, my partner's white, and he's even we, we've been together for six years. He's he's even begun to pick up using because I I my Cantonese is really really terrible, but you know it's probably around like an seven eight year old level of vocabulary. But I'm pretty good at using like process of elimination. So like mm-hmm. I'll, I'll like like I was so proud of myself. I actually f- deciphered um, a, a, a sign outside a restaurant that said. Uh, chicken chow mein, fifteen percent off after seven p.m. I was oh, like, yes. yeah. <laughs> even though I, even though I could really only like read like you know a handful of them, mm-hmm. um, but I, I you know Pearl, you what you spoke about really um, resonated with me, and I'm also thinking about you know I used to really beat myself up about not being able to master the language. I, I, I took, yeah, I, and, you know, I took Chinese school um, every Saturday till I was like 14, 15. But mm. the thing is, we didn't speak it at home. Mm. And so even though, you know, it was drilled into me every Saturday, the practice of it, you know, I and I, I tried, you know, up, up until actually just a couple of years ago to, you know, I was taking Cantonese lessons you know, to really like, I was like, no, I need to know the language, but also like um, kind of letting go of that pressure and, and yes. just mm-hmm. doing what I can, you know, I'll learn yes. what I can and I'll, I'll expand. Like I learned um, like the word for taxes, for example, last week, okay. <laughs> you know, but even just holding on to like just the couple words that I mm-hmm. can and yeah. not just being like, you know, feeling like a, that sort of pressure. To, yes. to learn the language and master it has been a big relief. <laughs> yes. And I think, oh my God, so many of us deserve that relief because if it's one thing Chinese people are good at is adding guilt and pressure to things <laughs> that don't need to be that serious. Like yes. Yes. one of the things that I used to put on myself was, so my mom immigrated here when she was seven. And so her Cantonese is just not great. Um, and, you know, being of that assimilating mentality, she didn't teach it to yeah. me. Um, and anti-black stuff, people didn't t- teach it to me in, in my family either because they didn't think it was useful. 
And I think a lot of parents are like, Cantonese is not useful, learn Mandarin instead, or just like speak yeah. English. I think that's actually like a very strong belief still um, in some generations. But one of the things I put on myself was, oh my God, my grandparents are getting older. They don't know how to speak English. I have to learn Cantonese in order to speak and communicate mm. with them because when they go, their stories will go with them. Yeah. And that was a huge weight on me because I was just like, I was racing against the clock, it felt like. Right. Um, but now I've reframed personally my own Cantonese journey as something that's for me and that I can do on my own time. And I, I remember making a tweet being like, you know what? I'm going to be, because I want to be fluent eventually. Um, and I was like, I'm going to be fluent in Cantonese in five years. And then someone was like, five years? I've never heard anyone say five years. Everyone's like fluent in six months, fluent, fluent in a year. And then someone said that to In a year. <laughs> I can't. I, look, a year? Are you? No, I got other how? shit going on. How? I got stuff going on. <laughs> right? Yeah. I was like, how? Um, but um, so, so for, for, for me to see that person being like, I've never seen someone put out a five-year goal to learn this language, that makes me feel so much relief. I was mm. like, oh my God, the pressure yeah. that we put on ourselves to yeah. carry the legacy of this language. I get it, but also we can free ourselves from that and, and reframe how we want the experience to be for ourselves. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I guess, you know, I mean, not to get all philosophical, but you know, there's things that are fighting us. Like I, I'm just, what I'm really drawn to is um, I, it's making me think about, um, we, we recently worked on a visual poem with uh, Kai Cheng Tom, where mm -hmm. she talks about um, the loss of her ancestral tongue, um, Toy, toy San, but mm -hmm. she also writes about sort of like the, um, you know, the Communist Party in China and also like the um, pressures of capitalism, you know, to make Mandarin, a, you know, a, a language to bring up, you know, yeah. the industry. And so we, we're fighting, we're up against a, a lot of really big forces here. <laughs> right. That make, it, that make it hard. Right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. We're just trying our best. And I think. <laughs> Uh, yeah, like so many systems in place and like actual systemic erasure of Cantonese mm -hmm. is happening. Like trying to go up against that, especially as part of the diaspora too. Like so many of us are here. And I think there's also that expectation in Chinese culture to be like perfect. I don't know if you've had this experience, but speaking whatever Chinese language you speak and having an elder being like, what are you saying? Oh, you don't know how to speak. And then like they oh, yeah. switch to English yeah. or they just stop talking to you in general. I'm just yeah. like, oh my God, I have to be perfect in order to participate in this space. And that's not true, you know, especially yeah. being here. We have our own culture. Like Cantonese culture has evolved differently here. Like mm -hmm. we we sprinkle in English. We we have different slang or whatever. And I think yeah. um, reframing that experience of like, you know, it doesn't have to be perfect. It can just be ours is is yeah. really something I hope we continue to carry on. That's really yeah. beautiful. I mean, one thing that I've, I've been just thinking of, like, because, yeah, the language mastering thing has been challenging, but I think one thing that I've been able to, like, sort of express that my own desire to for that, my uh, culture's heritage is also through cooking. I'm just Yay. thinking about my relationship with my aunt, my aunties and my, my dad's, particularly my dad's side of the family, too, that it's like that I can... Google, but my aunts were really actually quite impressed because I started I started learning how to make those soups. Um, yes, during the pandemic, more so than before, and they were very very impressed as to how <laughs> because, because it's all, because you can Google it now, right? And there's mm -hmm. tons of these recipes out there that you know I don't feel like I that I can do, <laughs> and I don't yes. feel like you know just because I don't you know yeah when when those aunties correct my. When the waitresses correct my grammar. <laughs> You're like, listen, I know how to make herbal uh, soup. Yes, exactly. <laughs> I'm pro. What uh, I'm curious. Uh, we're we're kind of getting closer to the end of our time, but I'm curious. Like, what, do you have any new projects coming up? What's uh, what's coming up for you? Yeah. So I am currently trying to develop my own animated series. Um, in 2020, I actually signed on with Netflix to um, try to develop it with them. Project ended up being terminated, but I am still trying to develop it on my own time and uh, pitch it to other studios. So I'm working yeah. on that while still trying to, um, while, still, while still working on Craig of the Creek full time. So nice. those are my two things that I'm working on Wonderful. right now. Mm -hmm. um, so we then have to ask uh, the one question we always ask our guests, which is, uh, what is your favorite hot pot ingredient or story or experience? 
Oh man. Oh man. <laughs> what? That's so hard. Okay. So <laughs> <laughs> there's, um, I don't know. I don't think it's a very popular hot pot item, but it's like the money bag. Um, it's like Inari skin and it's, it looks like a little pouch. Yes. Sometimes there's mochi in it or sometimes there's fish cake in it. Um, I really like that. And I also mm. really like, um, what is it? What is it? it it's, a, it's a fish ball again, but with mushroom filling in the, on the inside. Oh. Um, so oh. I like those things a lot. And a vegetable watercress. <laughs> Yes. Oh, yeah, <laughs> Love yeah. watercress. I recent I recently had a beef ball with mozzarella cheese in it. For what? Hot pot. That's it was intense. Whoa. It was very good. <laughs> I bet it was good. Yeah. <laughs> with the cheese. Yeah, yeah. I just never would think that cheese pair well, but then I have ramen and with cheese on it and it's yeah. amazing. Yeah. True. Yeah. I just I just never think to put those things together. Because, yeah. you know, most of us don't grow up with cheese in, like, yeah. Chinese mm -hmm. diets, right? So True. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much, Pearl. That was such a delightful conversation. And thank you so much for being on Hot Pot Talks. Thank you so much for having me. It was so nice talking with you both. Yeah. <laughs> Likewise. Don't go anywhere. <laughs> Great. Thanks, everyone. And we'll catch you on the next episode of Hot Pot Talks. Bye.